Good afternoon. Welcome to Learn at Home with VIA. My name is Nikki Wilson, and I'm a teacher who works as the STEM on the Move coordinator in a partnership between Mansfield University and Blast Intermediate Unit 17, funded by a PA Smart grant. Thanks for joining me for this lesson. Today, we're going to discover things about the hippopotamus. Latin name, Hippopotus amphibius. We're going to ask some questions like, where do they live? How big are they? What do they eat? How much do they sleep and when? Do they have hippo friends? Are they endangered? Then we'll have a video call with someone who has seen them in Africa. We'll have some review and then I'll tell you where you can get more information on hippopotamus. Where do hippos live? They live in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan means the areas of Africa that are south of the Sahara Desert. If you look at the map, you can see an arrow pointing to about where we live in the United States, and then a red arrow pointing to Rwanda, the one of the countries where hippos live in Africa. This map better shows where the hippos are in Africa. They're all south of the Sahara Desert. How big are hippos? They can weigh up to three and a half tons. The average SUV weighs two tons, so they're bigger, way more than your car. They're 10 to 11 feet long and about five feet tall. They're second only to elephants in size. What do hippopotamuses eat? Look at that picture. Huge mouth, big tusks. Oh, look at those teeth. No, they don't eat other animals. Hippopotamuses are herbivores. Do you remember what that means? Herbivores are animals that only eat plants. Because the days are so warm, Hippopotamuses stay in the water to regulate their body temperature and come out at sunset to graze. They can eat up to 80 pounds of grass. Sounds like a big salad to me. Do hippos sleep? Yes or no? Yes but they do a lot of sleeping and drowsing during the daytime when they're in the water because of the heat, since they graze after sunset. Do you know why they don't sunburn? Hippos secrete an oily substance that looks reddish that protects them and acts like a sunscreen. People used to think that they sweat blood. Do hippopotamuses have friends? If you said yes, you'd be right. They're quite social, and they live in groups with 15 to 30 other hippos. Those groups are called bloats of hippos. Are hippopotamuses in the wild endangered? They're not endangered yet. They're considered vulnerable, and that means they face a high risk of extinction in the wild according to the IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature's, Red List. We can help by being good stewards of our planet and doing all we can to protect the environment. Hello students, I'd like to introduce you to my friend, Dr. Michael Renner. He's a professor of biology, psychology, and environmental science at Drake University in Ohio. Ohio, Iowa, and Iowa, <laughs> Iowa oh, yeah, I messed up. It's okay, the students understand. He has traveled to Africa, so I asked him if he'd talk to us today about hippos. Uh, Dr. Renner, what led you, a professor from Iowa, to travel to Africa? You don't have enough time for the whole story, so I'll give you the short version. Um, my specialty is animal behavior. And once in a while, when you're a working scientist, you get asked to help out with things. And 
uh, about 10 years ago. I, I've been to Africa a few times, but the, the work that I do there every year started about 10 years ago when a, a colleague of mine, another scientist, contacted me and said that they were having a problem with the interactions between chimpanzees and people at a forest reserve area in Rwanda. And they thought maybe I could help them s solve that problem. Um, so I started traveling to Africa to work on that particular research project. And then it just sort of became a, an ongoing thing for me. So I, I, I got to go to Africa because of my work is the short answer. Wow. Do you always go alone when you go to Africa? I've been able to take uh, students from the university where I teach, which is Drake University in Des Moines, uh, with me most of the time when I go, uh, sometimes for research. Um, I also teach a class about every two years over there where I, I get to take 12 to 15 students at a time over there. Um, I have gone by myself, but it's a lot more fun when I can take students with me. That's really cool. I'd love to be a student and go with you. What else do you do when you travel to Africa? Well, I'm a, a, a research fellow at the University of Rwanda, um, which is, is just a polite way of saying we know who you are and it's okay if you hang out here. Um, it, it doesn't actually come with a paycheck or anything. It's just kind of a nice title. Um, so, so I help them with research projects sometimes. Uh, there are students at the university, both at the undergraduate level, getting their bachelor's degree, and then uh, more advanced students who are working on graduate degrees. Um, and around Kishwati Forest, which is the area that I work, where I work, um, that has just become a national park. And so they are trying to develop uh, develop the communities around there in ways that will, will help them, you know, show the tourists more about African life and, and be able to make some money in the process. And so there, there's a traditional dance troupe and there are um, local folk who are, are healers in you know, traditional folk medicine. Uh, there are, um, there's a women's craft cooperative and we work with all those groups to, to help them be more self-sufficient and help them understand what the tourist market is like so that when the tourists actually start coming to this brand new national park, uh, they, they'll have you know, products and experiences that people will want to pay for. Wow. So today we're talking about hippopotamuses that you've seen when you've gone in your travels to Africa. Do these supporting the people help support the hippopotamuses too? You know, it, it seems funny, but it really does. Um, if the local community understands that having these animals can bring tourists and those tourists bring money and they leave some of it behind when they, when they leave, um, then the local people get invested in protecting the, the, the reserve areas. Uh, Rwanda has four national parks. Uh, one of them has hippopotamuses in it. It's called Akagera National Park. And it's a... Uh, it's an amazing place. It's it's several hundred square miles. Uh, it's along the border between Rwanda and the country of Tanzania to the east. And wow. it's uh, it, it has both the swamp and wetland areas and a, a highland savanna area. And so you can see a lot of the things people think of that they go to Africa to see. You can see them all in one place. Wow. Um, uh, Akagera has, the last time they did a real census, there were about a thousand hippopotamuses in Akagera National Park. Um, but the protections for the land have gotten a lot better in the last decade or so. And so the, the rough estimate is there's more like 2,500 hippopotamuses there. Wow. And so it's really an amazing place. That uh, is the picture behind me is, is one of the swamps um, in, in Akagara National Park where there was a whole pod of hippos that, that greeted us as we went by. Nice. Yeah, we, we in our studies learned that hippopotamuses need to live near water and that they are social animals. They are so, very social animals. You can see groups of up to 30 of them hanging out together. Wow, just like us. <laughs> just like us. It's, it's kind of jaw-dropping to see, you know, a whole bunch of hippopotamuses. You see them in zoos and you see, you know, one, two, maybe three if it's a really great zoo. And when you get out to where they really live, you see much bigger groups. Wow. How many times have you seen hippopotamuses? Oh, heavens. Um... <laughs> At least 10 of my trips to Africa, I've had the chance to see hippopotamuses at least once. That is wonderful. Are you afraid of them when you see them? <laughs> at some distance, no. Um, anywhere close, absolutely terrifying. Um, this uh, is the most dangerous animal in Africa. 
Uh, wow. More people are killed by hippopotamuses than anything else. And so if they bounce up out of the water to let you know that they don't want you as close as you are, you back up right away. And okay. if they, uh, actually when I was there in January of this year, um, a mother hippopotamus bumped our boat. Um, she, she was under the water and we didn't know she was there. Oh and she my. was just warning us that we were closer than she wanted us to be. And so all of a sudden this, you know, 20 foot motorboat that I was sitting in just kind of bounced in the water. And the guide said, we gotta go and just slammed the throttle all the way forward. And he actually, he almost pitched me out of the boat. He accelerated so fast. Oh my. Um, and it, we, we got away from there and gave mom plenty of room because they, they really are quite dangerous if you interact with them wrong. But at a right. distance, they're, they're wonderful and interesting and they don't seek out trouble. They're just capable of defending themselves. Well, that makes sense. I'm going to share a photo from my screen share. It's one that you took of the hippopotamus that shows its mouth and its teeth. Um, okay. Oh, that's the wrong one, of course. Well, I guess since I shared the wrong one, maybe we'll talk about this one earlier than we thought. This is a picture that you shared with me of a dead hippopotamus. Can you tell us what happened? That hippopotamus had been dead for about a week. Um, he was up in the marshlands. He was probably a quarter of a mile from, from Lake Hago, where he had probably had been living. Um, and it, it, the, the folk stories, the, the, the local people believe that when hippopotamus knows that its time is coming, it hauls itself out of the water and gets away from the body of water before they die. Um, now, uh, hippopotamuses will come out at night. They're, they're a land animal. They actually can't swim. They walk along the bottom and they stay in shallow water. Um, and they're, they're, they're heavy enough that if they get out in deeper water, they sink, so they have to walk back to shallower water. But hippopotamuses come out at night to forage, you know, they eat the grasses. Um, they, they're, you know, it, it, it's a large hoof stock, so they eat a lot of plant material. Right. And so it's not unusual for them to be out of the water, but they say it is, the, the folks in the area say it's very unusual to see a dead hippopotamus in the water. Uh, when okay. their time comes, they, they get out, they get away from the water before, before they die. And th this fellow was a, a big bull, and, and he had gone easily a quarter of a mile from the nearest water and just lay down in this marsh and, and checked out. Okay. I have found the correct photo, if I would stop clicking on the wrong thing. Boys and girls, students, I'm learning as I'm doing this with you, so just so you know, it's okay to make mistakes. There's our hippo with big teeth. Do they have really bad teeth? Those teeth look like he needs to see a dentist. Uh, well, they don't get dental care, and I'm not about to reach into their mouths. Um, <laughs> Those those tusks have to last them, last them a lifetime. They don't get replaced. And so if they get beat up or they get decay, uh, you'll, you'll fairly frequently see hippopotamus with a broken tusk. Um, they just have to live with it. Um, they are, those, those are only used for fighting and defending themselves. So uh, the people who get killed by hippopotamuses, the hippos grab them in their mouths and usually get impaled on the tusks, which okay. is not really intentional so much as they're grabbing you to throw you. Um, they, they, the males use them to fight and the females will use them to defend that they're young, but it's not part of their life any, any way other than that. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're herbivores. They eat just plant material. They don't eat any animals on purpose. Um, so students, you know, that out. means their teeth are going to have flat grinding surfaces if they're a Most plant the eater. In their mouth. Yes. Most of the teeth in their mouth are, are, are like the molars, the teeth in the back of your mouth that are just right. big flat things. Um, the, the tusks are adapted just for social reasons, for fighting and defending themselves. And okay. all the food that they eat, um, they'll tear it off with their, their, their lips and they have small front teeth and then shove it to the back of their mouth to chew it up. Nice. Kind of grind it up like a grinding stone, get it chewed up so they can digest it. Well, and, and they're ruminants like cattle. So when they chew up something and swallow it, it, it bounces around among a couple of different stomach chambers um, so that they can get the nutrients out of it and digest it. Nice. Dr. Renner, what's the coolest thing you have seen hippopotamuses do? When I was there two and a half years ago, um, I, I actually saw a fight between two bull hippopotamuses. Wow. And it was high drama. I mean, it was, they, you know, they were up out of the water part of the way, and there was sometimes water splashing so much you really couldn't see what was going on. 
uh, I think it was just a standoff over over who was in charge essentially, um, right. and it went on a good five minutes or so with you know little little bouts of sparring back and forth, and then it would quiet down, and then they would go after it again, and they would quiet down, oh, and eventually wow. one of them just just headed off for the horizon and decided he'd lost. Oh, um, he, he just and, decided he'd had enough. Yeah, and I had a group of students with me, and this was a normally a pretty chatty group. And they just stood there in complete silence for about two or three minutes after the fight was over because they were so, you know, their eyes were the size of plates. And right. they, they, they were, it was quite an experience. And, and the amount of power you could see in those animals fighting was really pretty amazing. Cool. Do you have any other stories of your encounters you'd like to share with us? Most of them are just seeing them living their lives. So they, they don't make for great stories, but they make for great memories. I mean, the, the, the background right. I'm using, you know, was, was a pot of about six or seven animals, and I managed to get four or five of them in the picture. Um, and, you know, they were just submerging and surfacing, and the, the mom was sort of corralling the little guy uh, to make sure she, that he stayed close to her because he kept wanting to go explore. Uh -huh. And it... it they, they remind you of cattle in a lot of ways. They're, they're, they're big grazing animals. Okay. Um, but you just can't escape the sense that this is a really amazing moment and I'm just really privileged to get to see it. I think we know that feeling, don't we, students? Just observing an, a wild animal. So we talked about how great your photo is. Do you have any particular challenges when you're photographing hippos? Uh, not falling out of the boat is good. Um, you can't pose them. You can't arrange the situation. So you have to take what you get, essentially. And so there have been times when I've I've been, you know, moving through the countryside where I work, and I've seen hippopotamuses. And as cool as it was to see them, I could just tell that the the light wasn't the kind of light where I would ever get a decent picture. You know, right. it was behind them or it was directly overhead and super bright so everything was all washed out um you know the the, the challenge is that you get what you get um right. half the time you can't change your position to to compose the picture the way you want it to be uh the light is whatever it is and it may be great you know the, the, the picture behind me i got pretty lucky with the light um other times you know it's horrible uh, right. They may be doing something interesting, or they may see you coming and you know drop down below the surface of the water, and that means they may not come up for five minutes. So, wow. you know, if, if you're just passing by, you might go by and never know that they were even there. If they saw you coming before you saw them, and they dropped down under the water and just stayed there till you were gone, you you could have gone within twenty feet of a hippopotamus and, and not known you had. So, so they the would rather just, they'd rather well, not mess with you. They'd rather just let you walk by and and not even know they were there. They want to be left alone. Right. So the challenges with photography are that, that you can't control the situation at all. You know, a portrait photographer can pose people. You can, in most situations, you can move around the environment to, to line up the shot you want or to compose the picture the way you want it to be. And usually when you're dealing with you know, really wild animals and dangerous animals, you get what you get. And sometimes you're lucky and it, it the picture is composed right and has nice light and they're doing something interesting and sometimes you stand there for an hour and you get zero and that's just the way it goes but you still got to be there and that's the fun part so as a person you need a lot of patience if you're going to photograph wildlife any kind of nature photography uh, patience is the thing you have to have you have to just be there and be you know, fully in that moment you can't be checking your phone or they will do the most interesting thing they do all day when you're not looking um, you know, you can't you be talking go. to people because if they hear you talking, they'll leave. Um, you, you have to be quiet and fully present and just take advantage of the opportunities that pop up for you. Cool. That's, that's as good as a gift. Is our, we learned that uh, hippopotamuses are considered endangered. Is there anything our students can do to help protect them? Hippopotamuses are endangered mostly because their habitat is threatened. Um, mostly because the places they live are getting damaged and taken over by human activities. And so anything you can do to protect the environment generally helps people around the world learn that, you know, we, we only get this one planet to take care of. And so we, we have to learn to take better care of it than we have in the past. 
Um, there isn't much you can do directly to support hippopotamuses, except you know if you are as fortunate as I am and you, you, you find a reason to work there or you get the chance to go there and be a tourist or a student at some point, when you go into those areas and you pay for your lodging and you buy food and you maybe buy a souvenir, all of those things support the economy in that area. And it helps the people in that area understand that it's in their best interest to protect these animals as well. Because if the animals aren't there, we won't come visit. And so th there are a lot of things you can do all, all on the smaller scale. There, there isn't you know, someone you can call. Uh, there isn't a law that we can pass in this country that will save them in that country. And we already have a, a very strong law on the books that prevents the shipment of animals across national borders without you know, permits and, and a good reason and that kind of thing. Uh, so it, it's, it's important that you know, we support those environmental protections. And, and, and so we, we're supporting hippopotamuses when we're supporting conservation in general. Nice. Okay. Um, when you were in eighth grade, were you interested in animals? And did you think then that you would travel to Africa? I, I was interested in animals. Um, when I was in the third grade, I talked the school bus driver into letting me bring a possum on board. Um, <laughs> I found him in the basement of the school and didn't know what to do with him. And I said, I'll take him home, which lasted maybe 10 minutes when I got home because my parents were having none of it. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was always interested in animals. Um, I honestly didn't think it would be my career. And, and right. the beginning of my career wasn't going in that direction. Um, I always dreamed of going to Africa, but I actually never went to Africa the first time until I was... Geez, I think I was in my 40s. Wow. Um, and so I've been really lucky that, that this opportunity to work there came up, and I've been able to, to develop that into you know, work that people think is valuable enough that they want me to keep coming back. And, and so it's a, it's, it's, I'm just incredibly fortunate to get to do this. Very good. Um, do you have any advice for students that think they might like to travel to Africa as part of their job in the future? You know, the, the, the world your students are growing up in is going to be an international world. Um, you know, in, in spite of this pandemic that we have right now, the, the, the notion that you could live your entire life in one small place and not be affected by what goes on in other countries, I, I think that went away a long time ago, and we're still figuring out what that means. So being aware of how international the world is, um, you know, le learning another language, learning about other cultures, you may find a career that takes you there inherently, but you also might be able to, to find opportunities to go and, and just visit to, to learn more about it. And anything you can do that, that gets your feet on the ground in a place that's strange to you, yeah, I, I think it's good for your head. It, it makes you think about why you do things the way you do them, because other people do them differently, and that's okay. Yeah. That's a very good idea. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we say goodbye? I, I'm, I'm just glad we got to have this conversation. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm always good to talk about animals, so I'm glad you, you, you contacted me and asked if I'd be willing to do this. this is well, fun. depending on Thank the you. schedule for Learn at Home with BIA, we may call on you again. Thank you very much, Dr. Renner. All right. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you. You too. A review of some of the facts we learned today. Hippopotamuses live in sub-Saharan Africa. They weigh up to three and a half tons and are five feet tall and 10 to 11 feet long. Hippopotamuses are herbivores. They eat at sunset and nap during the day. Hippos live in groups called bloats. They're vulnerable and need our protection. For more information about hippopotamuses, check out the websites of the African Wildlife Foundation, the Animal Diversity Web, National Geographic Kids, Reference.com, the World Atlas, or the World Wildlife Fund. I hope you've enjoyed our look at hippopotamuses. Thank you for joining me on Learn at Home with VIA.